warns you that extremism in the defense of liberty is no vice. Travis Cook, back with you once again. And a few weeks back on this very program, we talked about Barack Obama's foreign policy. We talked about specifically uh, his policy in the Middle East. And I entitled his foreign policy at that time, Peace, Even If It Kills Us. Well, in the ensuing two or three weeks since we've done that show, things have continued to degenerate over there. The Middle East is absolutely... Uh, completely the F on fire. I mean, even more so than usual. So the idea that Barack Obama seems to have that uh, America can just quietly step out stage right and everything will be hunky-dory is pretty clearly not working. So what that means is that we as Americans need to now take a look at the situation when you've got this ISIS bunch of jokers uh, taking Iraq apart piece by piece. You've got Hamas shooting rockets over into Israel right now. You know, Israel, who were supposed to be our allies, but Obama seems to have forgotten this. And, of course, Syria and Iran and all those other jokers doing their usual garbage. The whole thing is is busting part of the seams. So it seems to me that we as Americans need to take a look at this situation and and kind of hit the reset button. Um, Reassess what we've done and what we need to do to deal with this threat, to deal with this issue. Now... One thing about it, any of you who've watched my show for very long, you you probably know that most of the topics we talk about on this show end up being pretty partisan in nature. Um, We end up talking about things most of the time that, okay, the conservatives will generally agree with me on, the liberals will call me any number of four-letter words on, and yeah, it works out pretty well. Today's going to be one of those issues that I expect to get a lot of disagreement from every side of the political spectrum. The things I'm going to suggest today on this show... Yeah, the liberals are going to hate me for it, like they usually do. But hey, there's a lot of conservatives and even Tea Partiers who might not like some of the things they got to say. But this is a very important situation. Our lives are on the line here. So I think it behooves us to talk about it honestly and come up with a good way forward. First of all, when we talk about the Middle East, when we talk about Iraq, Afghanistan, the things we've done over the last 13 years, I think the first thing we need to do as we stand here today and hit that reset button is we need to talk about the mistakes that we've made over the years. And no, I'm not going to tell you that going into Iraq was a mistake. It was not. That's not what I'm talking about. But I think the mistakes we've made in this war, starting on September 12, 2001, is that we have tried to too narrowly focus our wars. We've tried to too narrowly focus this conflict. We have bent over absolutely backwards to try and focus this on the Taliban or focus this on Al-Qaeda or focus this on Osama bin Laden. And granted, all three of those entities are very uh, important factors in this war. But let's face it, you kill off Osama bin Laden, you do not eliminate the threat to America. And I think our problem, one of our main problems has been that we've tried to kind of microscope this war a little bit and, 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 and determine our enemies with too fine of a point. We have never admitted who our enemies really are. We've never admitted that it's not just these few rogue extremists in the Muslim world who are the problem. We've been too scared to admit to ourselves that it is the entire culture over there. And yes, that includes their religion. Their religion is the problem. Their religion and their culture are what need to be eradicated. We've made the mistake of not realizing that and acting upon it. Another mistake we've made is that over here stateside, we've again bent over backwards to pretend as though anybody could be a terrorist. Oh, we just don't know who the terrorists are. You know, it wouldn't be Muslims, would it? You know, no, no. Instead, we've got TSA agents filling up grandma. Or x-raying your little kids, you know, because they're going to carry a bomb. Ah, but but we can't bother, you know, Haji the Arab over there in his, in his chic-looking headdress over in the airport. No, we can't bother him. He couldn't be the terrorist. It's Granny over there. You better strip search her. Or we got the NSA looking up all of our phone calls and our emails and so forth. 
as though any of us can be the terrorists. And yet, Muslims have always been the ones to attack us on these shores. Amazing how that works. You know, instead of having the TSA and the NSA focus on Muslims, focus on mosques, focus on that community that, you know, is killing Americans left and right. Oh, no, they try to pretend that anybody's a potential threat. There's no evidence of that. And finally, we, and specifically this president, have tried to use diplomatic means to resolve this issue. We've tried to use diplomatic means on a people that, frankly, are not advanced enough to understand diplomacy. They only understand violence. So if you use, or you try to use diplomatic means on them, you're speaking a foreign language. It's like playing poker with a guy who's insanely rich. You try to bluff him out of a pot, and he'll call you down anyway because the money doesn't mean anything to him. Well, we threaten them with sanctions. They don't care about sanctions. They're willing to blow themselves up. Threaten them with economic sanctions. They don't care. They're poorer than dirt anyway. The only thing these people understand is violence, and yet we've been so unwilling to use that as our first resort. So those are the mistakes we've made. But what must we do going forward? Well, one of the suggestions that I hear from a lot of people, and, and make no mistake, I hear this suggestion from people on all sides of the political spectrum. This is not just liberals saying this to me. I hear conservatives say this too. I hear moderates say it. One of the suggestions I always get is, just let them all fight each other and America just stay the hell out of it. Well, I understand that's an attractive viewpoint, and it's true that there have been conflicts going on over there that have lasted longer than America has even been around. I get it. And I understand there's all these different subgroups over there, your Taliban's and Al-Qaeda's and Kurds and Hamas and Shiites. By the way, you do know what the mating call of the University of Georgia sorority girl is, don't you? She got I'm drunk! All right. Hat tip to the old uh, comedian Louis Grizzard, God rest his soul. I digress. Point of all of this is, like I talked about earlier, we try to just microscope this down and separate everybody in these little, little groups and say, well, this group's okay, this group's not. No, 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 no. They're all fighting each other until we come to the scene, and then they all try to fight us. The problem is the culture. The problem is all of those groups. There are no good groups over there. And letting them all fight each other is not going to work because, frankly, we did that for a number of decades. And then what happened? September 11, 2001. So pretty well tells you that just staying out of it and letting them all fight each other is not going to work. They're just going to bomb us over here anyway. They're just going to attack us again over here like they did before. And consider what happens if we just drop out of the thing. If we just say, all right, y'all fight each other, we're getting out of Dodge. Does peace suddenly come about to America if that happens? I'm not asking if peace comes about over there. I don't care what, what happens over there in terms of peace. But are we safer? No. Not at all. I mean, do you really think that if we back down in the Middle East and we walk away, if we leave Afghanistan, leave Iraq, leave wherever the hell we are over there, do you seriously think all them Arabs, all them Muslims are going to sit there and go, ah, the Americans are gone, we chased them out of here, bygones? Hell no, they're going to see it as weakness, and they're going to redouble our efforts. They want what we've got. They want us and our culture, and yes, our religion, because America is a Christian nation. They want us dead. They're going to see that. As, as a pit bull sees blood on another animal or a shark sees blood in the water. Doing nothing or stepping out of this fray does not eradicate the danger to America. It only puts bigger targets on our back. So we can't just step away and let them all fight each other. But if we are going to fight them, how do we do it? Well, we can no longer try to make this a bunch of little micro wars. We can no longer try to make this a surgical mission where we just go after the Taliban or just go after ISIS or just go after Al-Qaeda. No. We've got to realize it's a culture war. And yes, we must realize this is a holy war. You know something? The most, in any conflict, the most aggressive party is always the one that sets the terms of the fight. Well, up to now, the uh, Muslims have been the most aggressive party, unfortunately. 
And they've defined this as a holy war. We don't have any other alternative but to fight on that basis. Our war is against their culture. And yes, our war is against their religion. Now, we didn't ask for this war, but we do not have the option of not fighting it. We can't turn this war down because they'll just be over here blowing the hell out of us anyway. So as uncomfortable as it might be for some people who may not have a grasp on the real world, we've got to fight their culture, we've got to fight their religion. And then finally what we must do is we must bring to them a level of violence greater than what they're used to, greater than what they've even ever seen. We said earlier that these people do not understand diplomacy, they're not advanced enough for that, and we cannot in any sort of short order make them understand diplomacy. The only thing they understand is violence. So that means that we have no choice but to bring to them a level of violence so great and so pervasive that even they can't help but notice it. And yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. Nuclear weapons must be on the table in this conflict. Now, some of you think I'm crazy. Some of you think I'm nuts. They said the same thing about Barry Goldwater back in 1964. He advocated that we have limited usage of nuclear weapons in Vietnam. Everybody said he was nuts. Everybody said he was crazy. You know, Barry Goldwater had a campaign slogan that said, in your heart you know he's right. Well, after he made the statement about uh, limited use of nuclear weapons in Vietnam, the Johnson campaign kind of spread it around and, and, and changed that phrase and popularized a phrase of their own, in your guts you know he's nuts. But as it turned out, Goldwater wasn't nuts, he was right. Because Barry Goldwater adeptly pointed out that if we did not fight the Vietnam War with everything we had, with every capability we had, leaving nothing on, off the table, leave, leaving no stone unturned, that it would be a quagmire. We would be there for years on end, and we would never accomplish much of anything. Well, gee, hindsight's twenty twenty. I know that, but my God, didn't Goldwater turn out to be 100% right there? It's true. That's the lesson we should learn from Vietnam. That's the lesson we should learn if you go even further back to Korea. We've tried to halfway fight this war in the Middle East the way we halfway fought Vietnam, the way we halfway fought Korea, and we've accomplished about as much. If we're going to fight this war, and we have no choice but to fight this war, we have to fight it to win. We have to fight it to eliminate their culture. We have to fight it to kill. We have to fight it to destroy the Middle East as we know it today, because as of the actions of September 11, 2001, the Middle East, Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, Iran, wherever you want to name it, with the exception of Israel, the Middle East does not have the right to exist on planet Earth anymore. Period. Now, I suggested that to somebody one time in a conversation. They accused me of supporting genocide. Well, I don't know if that fits the uh, description of genocide to a T or not, but if it does, I say, hell yes, I'm in favor of genocide. What we need in the Middle East is what I like to call Manifest Destiny Virgin 2.0, which is to say, we bring a level of violence to the Middle East that they've never seen before, and we have the capability to do that. We have the weaponry, we have the technology, we have the resources, so we can do it, we just haven't. You bring them a level of violence they've never seen, you destroy their countries, and anything that's left, you convert to Christianity and to Western values. Now I know some of you are jumping up and down and screaming, how dare we force our religion on them? Well, setting aside the fact you're trying to force their religion on us, I would suggest this. Even if you don't believe in Christian theology, and shame on you if you don't, but if you don't believe in Christian theology, I would still suggest that you would have to admit 
that a Christian pro-Western Middle East would be far easier for America to deal with in the long term. And it would be far easier for America to even have some degree of control over, to trade with in the long term. And at the end of the day, that is what all foreign policy is about. Foreign policy is not about finding a way for the world to live together peaceably. Any world history course will show you that's impossible. Foreign policy is about putting your country in the best position to press its advantages and to protect its own safety. That's how we have to look at the war in the Middle East, the war on Islam. It's time to bring the pain. It's time to bring the terror on a level that those some bitches have never imagined before. The question is, I'm not even going to ask the question of Obama because I know he didn't have the guts to do it. But the question is, do the American people have the guts to engage in what could be the final fight of this great nation? That's it for this week. This is America's Evil Genius. We will see you next time.